Oh, parson for a living, oh, every day. Parson for a living, oh, every way. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? I was supposed to be up playing video games right now. I'm supposed to be up playing video games. I was playing. I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2. Until I killed my horse again. <laughs> until I killed my horse again. <laughs> oh my golly, Red Dead Redemption 2 is just too emotional for me. Right? You have this horse, and you groom the horse, and you pat the horse on the head, you create this bond with the horse, and then your horse is so stupid, so stupid. It keeps smacking in trees. Oh my golly, it was like, I don't know what the hell happened. Like literally, I just gave it, because I was going through this town, I was literally going through this town, and there was some people over here, and there was a, uh, a stagecoach or something over here, so I'm just trying to go around the people and around the stagecoach. And for some reason, my horse like gallops onto the stagecoach and then like slams up the people. And then they all start screaming and shoot me. And I just like, I, I can't deal with this. This isn't fun. This isn't fun. I don't understand what video games nowadays. I want fun video games. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Gen Xer. I'm a Gen Xer. I think video games should be fun. Oh, it's like that whole thing now with Last of Us 2. Last of Us 2 sounds horrible. Last of Us 2. Why is anybody playing that? It's like, yeah, you get to have your father figure get beat to death. And then all this other crap happens. No wonder millennials are so damn depressed. Isn't it weird? Isn't it weird? Violent, violent crime, literally and truly, in the United States, violent crime has literally been decreasing uh, since I was in high school. <laughs> when I was in high school, it's actually like one of the most violent times in the United States. So anyways, it's been decreasing since I was in high school. Things are so good, but in many ways, things are so good. But everybody's so pissed off. I want to posit something here. I want to posit something. I think the video games are screwing with people's heads. I don't think the video games are really making people more violent. Again, because you ever actually hit anybody, if you actually ever fired a weapon, used a weapon, if you've ever actually hit anybody, if you've ever ever actually been in a highly stressful uh, situation, that has nothing to do with video games. Uh, again, if you don't lock your wrist, <laughs> for any video game players out there, lock the wrist. There's nothing funnier. There's nothing funnier than a Call of Duty Ranger who doesn't know how to lock a wrist. <laughs> ah! Ow. Anyways. Uh, but I think it's not the violent. I think I think I think video games and a lot of the entertainment is just that it's making people so pissed off because you have you have these horses, you have all this stuff, and then they're emotionally pinging you, and then it's telling you to like shoot your horse in the head. It's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, I'd rather do work. <laughs> I'd rather do work nowadays and play video games. I'll I'll let you guys virtually shave yourselves and change your clothes and bathe your horses you go and bathe the virtual horse and i'll go write some code anyways i was just up there <laughs> it's the real world it's the real world i'm serious like so many times with red dead why is red dead redemption too fun because I've, I've been waiting with a little while because a lot of these video games a lot of video games they're so long that like the initial introduction people per uh, amount of time is a long time so it's a little boring like in the old days when a video game only lasted an hour the tutorial session was like five minutes now the video games last 100 hours the tutorial session is like i don't know 10 hours so i'm trying to get through i'm trying to get through to see if it actually gets to be more enjoyable <laughs> right now it just seems depressing <laughs> And again, like with the horses, the horses are so stupid. Like I did the Uber route, I did the Uber thing. So, so there you, you do Uber. You're basically, you're hauling people. You're picking people up, like stagecoaches break and horses fall on people. And like there was this one, like the, the, uh, the, the horse fell on this woman. So I took this woman back to town and then I dropped her off. And then I'm like, bye, nice lady. And then my horse runs over. It's right so <laughs> horse like gallops up on his little boardwalk thing and the legs just smacks right over <laughs> oh, it's the most screwed up game. It's just like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying not to be old. I would say Red Dead Redemption 2. It is somewhere between completely frustrating and horribly depressing. <laughs> it's just not that fun. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to talk about. Anywho. Maybe we'll talk about that after we get done with the technical stuff. So, uh, as you may or may not know, we've been playing around with InMap lately. So, InMap 
N M A P uh, is a nice command line uh, network mapping software. So basically, with N Map, what you can do is you can run the command line utility, and it can go out and it can scan your network. So it can scan for IP addresses, scan for host names, scan for MAC addresses, give you vendor information, scan for ports, scan for a lot of different things. Right. So now, especially with me focused on trying to educate you folks, one of the things I've been thinking about is how to like parse that information. Uh, so parsing information is basically where you read the output. Uh, from programs so that you can then do something interesting with that output. So yesterday, yesterday, I spent half the day uh, trying to deal with something called simple XML. No, no, no. So with Nmap, you can output multiple different ways. Uh, you can output to basically plain text, you can output to XML format, and you can output to grep. Grep is apparently supposed to be deprecated. So I don't want to teach you folks too much old stuff. So I'm not going to do grep. Uh, so I figured, okay, I'll take the XML, right? So with XML, basically what it is, is everything gets tagged. Uh, it looks a lot like HTML. It basically looks like HTML. It doesn't work like HTML, but it looks like HTML. So basically everything is tagged. So this is what this is. This is what this is. This is what this is, which makes it very nice and easy to go through and parse because every everything is essentially tagged. So basically you find the tag you're looking for. And then you parse that particular line. So anyways, uh, there is an extension for PHP called Simple XML. Uh, I thought this was going to make life a lot easier because basically what it can do is it can take an XML file and it can turn that XML straight into an array. So basically you run it through Simple XML, it takes your XML file, turns it into an array, and then you can access uh, the data in that array just as if it's an array, which would be very easy. Um, that did not work. <laughs> To be clear, simple XML actually seems to work well on simple XML uh, files. Um, when I tried to get it to work with uh, the Nmap XML file, I had all kinds of problems. It was just not a happy boy. So I decided to basically go back and reinvent the wheel. That's one thing to be thinking about as a noob, right? So a lot of noobs, they want to reinvent the wheel for everything, right? There's a lot of, a lot of noobs out there who refuse to use WordPress. Why would I use WordPress? That's not professional. I'll build my own CMS system. So basically, you have a lot of noobs. Instead of being able to stand up a CMS in three, literally three hours and put it into a production environment, they think it's more professional to like spend a year building their own CMS. And uh, what I try to explain to people is, you know, when you have a boss, when you have a boss who's paying your salary, they can either pay the equivalent in salary of about $100 for you to stand up a CMS, or they can pay the equivalent of about $100,000 for you to stand up a CMS. And that $100 CMS is going to work better. It's going to be more robust. It's going to be more secure. <laughs> it's going to be easier for people to maintain. <laughs> but no, but no, real tech professionals are going to spend $100,000 of their boss's money to build a less secure, less robust, more pain in the ass system. Because I think that's what professional is. But anyways, one of the things you have to be thinking about in the tech world is most of the time you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Most of the time you're dealing with problems everybody else has dealt with. So you just go out, grab something off the shelf, Audit the code. Audit the code. Take a look at the code. It should be fine, and away you go. Uh, well, the thing is, uh, for me, uh, like with this, with simple XML, uh, simple XML didn't work how I thought it was going to. And I actually wanted to do a lot of searching. I couldn't find anything that really parses in map XML. Uh, so I decided to reinvent the wheel, essentially. Or reinvent what should be the wheel, but doesn't seem to be out there. So yesterday, I... Um, basically was able to figure out how to pull uh, the IP address from the XML file from Nmap, and that's what I showed you folks yesterday. And then so today, basically what I did is I copied and pasted, I copied and pasted that little statement, um, modified it a little bit uh, so that I can now pull out the IP address, I can pull out the vendor, I can pull out the MAC address, I can pull out the host name, I can pull out the ports that are open, and that now all displays on a screen. So now what I have, now what I have is this. So I'm going to show you folks a little bit about this today, and then I'm probably going to do a class on this later. Once, I, once I've worked out everything in my head and I've, I've cleaned up the code a little bit, I'll probably do a class on this. But this, this is basically what we have now. So what we, what we initially had, what did we initially have? No, not that. So what we initially had was this, this. So this is basically, all this is, is a text output from Nmap, right? So basically, Nmap prints to a text file. I use a PHP script to basically include that text file, and that's what you get. Uh, the thing with this is it shows you a lot of information, but you can't really do anything. Uh, with it. You can't do if else's, you can't screw around, you can't play with it. Um, this is just basically a static output. Uh, then what I did, like I say with the XML, then I outputted to XML, and when you output to XML, this this is why this is why I thought 
I could do something interesting. So again, the simple XML. So the simple XML turns your XML file into an array. And so I thought I was going to be able to do interesting things. So I thought this was going to be like named keys. So I thought it was going to be like a multi-level array. And I was going to be able to use named keys and pull out information. Um, and that did not work out. <laughs> I have this. I have this, but that's about that. So what I did, what I did then, is today I used PHP. So I used PHP to go through the XML file and then just simply like with PHP get through and parse out this information. So why this is useful now, you may be sitting here going, okay, well, why, why is this more useful than this? Because this is printing out values for variables. This is simply outputting a text file. So this is a text file, I can't really do anything with it. The cool part here is you're actually outputting the values of a variable. So a value for this variable is now 192.168.1.1. The value for this variable is now Netgear. The value for this variable is that MAC address. The value for this variable is a gateway and a port, right? And so that's the thing. It's once you, once you can turn something into a variable value, then you can do if else statements based off of it, then you can print it out on a screen, then you can dump it into a MySQL database or a database of some sort, uh, the whole nine yards. And so this is where we have going on today. So basically what I do is I print out device, bold, underlined, and then I give the IP address, the vendor, the MAC address, the host name, if it's showing up, and the ports that are open. And I think that's kind of cool. I think that's kind of cool. So let's go over and take a look at the crappy code. See, one of the reasons I like doing these kind of videos is as I talk through this, as I talk through this, I can figure out what's wrong with my crappy code. So that I can try to fix my crappy code before, um, oh, before I actually do a class on it. Like one of the interesting things I found today, one of the interesting things I learned about Nmap, if you want to know something about Nmap, um, in order to get the MAC address for Nmap, you actually have to run Nmap as sudo, super user do. Uh, if you run Nmap, just plain Nmap, plain Nmap will run, uh, but you don't get the MAC addresses or the vendor information. In order to get the MAC addresses and the vendor information, you actually have to run as sudo. So if you're going to do a cron job, make sure to do cron as sudo cron tab space hyphen e. If you do cron tab space hyphen e and add the Nmap as your cron job, it will not be running as a super user and therefore you won't get MAC addresses and then also vendor information. Uh, so you have to do sudo cron tab space hyphen e that will be the uh, the uh, cron tab for root and then it will run with root privileges uh, so that's the kind of stuff that's why i do these kind of videos because it works out all the props <laughs> i sit i sit here and i figure out all the stupid things i do and then try to figure out how to fix them so that's one thing uh anyways so let's go take a look at this uh this particular code so um basically uh what we're pulling in here is so we have a file so again, this is PHP, and we have a file, and that file is nmaptest.xml. So basically what I did is I created an nmap XML and then I copied it. And again, so you understand what I'm talking about parsing, this is this is what the nmap XML looks like. So you got all this kind of crap in here. And basically what I want to do is I want to pull out the information that I actually care about um, and not have all this crap here. Like there is just so much stuff here I don't want to see. And as you can see, once you parse, once you parse, then you get then you get something formatted the way you want it to look, not like this. Again, put this in front of an end user or put this in front of a very tired system administrator and things are probably not going to go well. Put this in front of a system administrator and they're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, it's easy to understand. Um, so anyways, so this is what we're parsing here, XML. And again, this is where I'm talking about like tags. So we look for things like tags. We look for like basically what I want as I'm parsing through is I'm looking for anything I can I can basically say if you see this then do something to this line. Uh, so okay, so we got nmap.xml that's that. Then for each, uh, and then we have file as line num line. So I actually probably need, need to get rid of this line num. So yesterday when I showed you the demonstration, all my lines were numbered. Um, today my lines are no longer numbered. Um, I just didn't put that in there today, so don't worry about that. Uh, so basically as line. So what this is going to do is it's for each. So basically it steps through the file line by line by line by line by line. So it's going to go to the first line. It's going to go to the first line. It's going to say if and then string position. This is basically like a search. 
uh, in the line. And what I'm going to say is in line, I want you to look for ADDR type equals uh, IPv4. So basically if we go here, um, I want you to look for this. So if the line has this, then I actually want to parse that line. Then we're going to go down here we're going to line filter we're going to use a filter for this particular thing because it's an address and we want to filter sanitize url so this is going to strip out a lot of extraneous information and then what i do want to do is for line i want to left trim so left trim i want to trim off address addr equals colon so basically what i want to do is i want to delete all of this right and then after I do that, I want to right trim, R trim, all of this. And so when I R trim that, that's going to then trim off all of this. And then finally, uh, I'm then going to print out device strong underlined. Uh, so again, this is going to be a new device. Every time we see a new device, I want to do a new device and the brakes. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say IP address and then I'm going to print out whatever the value of line is and so then that is going to give you your IP address. So you see the IP address there. And so that is how we're able to parse the IP address. So if there's an IP address, you do this. Uh, then ports, so ports I just have, I probably need to switch how this is here. But anyways, ports, so basically these are for open ports. So if string position line port ID equals uh, so what we want to do here is we're looking for this. So if we have this in a line, we want to parse that line. Then we're going to do uh, a match. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to be looking for this. So basically if we see port ID equals colon, uh, period, star, anything, uh, and then uh, these little marks here, right? So basically what it's doing here is, um, so port ID, so port ID, and then it's, it's basically period star, and then like this. So basically if it finds that, it wants to grab that. And so it'll grab just that, and then output the results to results. So for here, what it would do is uh, basically it would grab port ID equals 53 all the way to here. So this is what it will grab and put to results. Then once it's in results, results is now actually an array. So I want to do something called implode an array. So I'm gonna take the array and turn it into a string. So that's what I'm gonna be doing here. I'm gonna be taking the array, turning it into a string. Then once results is now a string, I want to L trim. So I want to left trim from results. I want to trim off um, all this crap. Huh. I need to work on that. Anyways, that probably shouldn't be there. Anyways, I want to trim off all this crap. And then from the right trim, I want to trim off all this crap. And that's going to give me the port number. And so basically when you sit here and you look at this, it's going to give you these ports. So every time it sees a port, it will then say port and then whatever port is under that IP address. So 53, 80, 5,000, uh, 5,009, 10,000, 62,078, so on and so forth. This one has, right? Um, and so that's basically how it goes through and it prints out the ports. Then we're gonna go down here to host name. So if there is a host name, a lot of these we can't actually get the host name, but if uh, basically there's a type PTR. So if I went over here and I looked for a PTR, so I can do control F, PTR. So uh, basically if, if I find this, right, then I know there's gonna be a name. And so for this it's Ubuntu. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if there's type of PTR equals true, then I'm going to try to rip out name equals, so what the name is, uh, that's going to go to results. I'm then going to turn the results into a string using implode. Then what I'm going to left trim from results, name equals colon. Then I'm going to right trim from results, space type. And there's a weird thing here. And then I have to right trim from results again, the additional quotation. So if I do quotation, space type, it actually takes off a couple of letters off of the uh, host name for some reason. Not really sure why that is. So if I remove space type first, and then once that's gone, I then remove colon, then I get the host name. And so basically, if we sit here and we take a look at it, oh, that's how uh, we have a host name here. So underscore uh, gateway is that, or for this, this particular device, host name is Ubuntu. So that's how you're able to then parse that host name. Uh, then we're going to go down for vendor. So again, for that vendor information. Um, 
So strpos line equals address type equals Mac. Um, so that again for the Mac address. So if we do a control F Mac, what we're going to see here is basically for the Mac address, this is then going to give us the, the information for the Mac address. And it's actually also going to give us the information for the vendor. Uh, so uh, once we grab that line, we are going to match out. We're going to basically copy out the vendor information, put that to results, uh, turn results into a string. We are going to rip off vendor colon uh, quotation mark on one side. Uh, we're going to write trim. We are going to take off the quotation on the other side. And then vendor is going to be results. And then this is where we get the vendor. So we got Apple here, lots of Apple. We got Netgear here, and that's how we get that. And then we go down, I think the final thing is the MAC address. Again, same thing, address type MAC, because that's what we got here. So address type MAC, but now we're looking this way instead. And then we parse that, so we're trying to grab out uh, the address. So basically the ADDR equals uh, Quotation marks, period, uh, period star. So this is for anything wild card. Um, so basically it's going to be trying to find all of that information, right? Basically turn that into results, turn results into a string. Then with this, we are going to remove ADDR equals colon from the one side. And then we're going to remove colon space ADDR type from the other side. And then that is going to give us our MAC address. Yay! And then we got our MAC address. Um, and so again, the important thing to be looking at here is that we are now we are now spitting out a variable of values. Again, I probably need to clean up this code a little bit, but the important thing is I'm putting out variable values here. So right now I am printing out the variable values to a screen, but I could just as easily, again, like I say, I could dump this into a database or I could test against this value to have some other thing trigger or fire off. So that's what I've been doing today. That's what I've been doing today. Not too bad. Not too bad. That just took the morning. Took a couple of hours to do. And uh, now I've got this. Now I've got this. Yay! Yay! Do you want to be a florist now? Do you want to be a florist? <laughs> you know you want to be a florist. You know you're looking at this going, wait a minute, what? This is going to be my job? Oh no, your job is going to be so much worse. Just remember, just remember, whenever I'm showing you something like this, this is the work I decided to give myself. <laughs> this is the work I decided to do. So, anyways. Excited about that. Excited. Now we're parsing. Now we're parsing in map. And again, the cool thing is, is once you understand how to parse text files or XML files, then you can parse all kinds of different things. So this is for in map. You could parse lots of stuff right and then again then you start parsing all of these reports from different things and then you can dump it into things like databases and then you can have scripts you know fire off and, and see um, like an interesting thing is with um, like log files right if you can parse log files so imagine all of your devices on a network have log files See your network devices, uh, your like your networks, your firewalls have uh, log files. Your uh, your client computers have log files. Your servers have log files. Like everything has log files. So imagine if you start creating scripts that are then able to parse the log files for all of these different devices, dump the relevant or interesting information into one database server, uh, possible multiple tables within that database server, and then you can start then you can start trying to find connections. Right. So so basically, if you have to, if you have multiple security alerts, if your firewall triggers something and you're getting bad passwords and you're getting a couple of other things all within a couple minute time span, that may then alert you to an active attack going on. And then you need to look at that situation. So in order for for you to be able to do that, you need to be able to, to be able to access the log files. You need to be able to parse the log files somehow. You need to take that parsed information, put it into something like a database, and then you need to continuously run scripts on that database looking for looking for flags. So basically, um, you know, whatever. And then, so, anyways, uh, the world of IT, the world of IT, the world of technology. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it exciting? Isn't this so much more? Isn't this so much more exciting than bezels? Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. Anyways, I do have to say, I am very happy. I am very happy with my little Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, guess so you know. Guess so you know. I am as happy with my Raspberry Pi 4 as I am with my my Mac Pro. 
Now, to be clear, my Mac Pro is a much more powerful machine. But this little guy, this little guy is actually very swift. So I have my, I have my little Raspberry Pi 4 here. And my Raspberry Pi 4 is, is running the full uh, Ubuntu desktop uh, distribution. Um, and I'm actually doing everything on the Raspberry Pi 4. So what I expected, I expected the Raspberry Pi 4 to be so low power and resources. What I thought was going to happen was that I was going to build my server and then basically I'd use my demonstration machine and then on my demonstration machine write all the code and basically dump it onto the Raspberry Pi 4 and then run it there. Um, honestly though, I'm just doing everything right on the Raspberry Pi 4. Again, don't don't try to edit 4K videos. <laughs> don't try to watch 1080p videos. But if all you're doing is basic server stuff and basic like uh, code, PHP code, scripting, like that kind of thing, uh, it's surprising how well it works. I, I've now been using this for, for a while now, for like a week and a half or something. And um, really, it just, it just trucks along. Again, Basic basic Linux tasks, basic Linux server tasks. To be clear, basic Linux server tasks. But, but for those basic uh, Linux server tasks, um, it is trucking along surprisingly, surprisingly nicely. So I was talking about this in some video where you know for a long time there's been the idea of virtualization, the idea of create virtual machines and then put them on one hypervisor. I do actually wonder with the power of these little boxes anymore, if we might go to a world where you literally, you have it, you start having multiple physical servers. So imagine if this, you know, this is your Active Directory server and then right beside it, you have a little file server and right beside that, you have a little VPN server and right beside that, you have a little something else server. You obviously would need to have a backup solution and all that kind of thing. But then imagine that, then there's no real single point of failure. If, if the motherboard or whatever for this dies, you just pull out the SD card, shove it into another Raspberry Pi 4, and it's all up and running in like a couple of minutes. I mean, like, think about that for a second. Again, I think that's an important thing to be thinking about in the technology world is everything is revolutionary, revolutionizing, everything's changing all the time. And so for a long time, like, there's been this idea of go to virtualization. Okay, we'll create very inexpensive uh, instances of servers on relatively expensive hardware. But think about this in this modern world, right? So if you have a Raspberry Pi and the OS and everything is installed on the little micro SD card, imagine a world where your, ser your server fails and then you just pop the micro SD card, grab another uh, Raspberry Pi 4 off the shelf, literally plug the micro SD card back in, plug it in, make sure nothing's corrupted and away you go. Therefore, again, you don't have the same single points of failure, right? If you have if you have ten machines running in instances on a virtual on a hypervisor, right? If the motherboard fails, you're screwed. If the power supply fails, you're screwed. Like if a lot of things fail, you know, you still have these single points of failure. You have a single point of failure that could take down ten instances. So it's kind of interesting an idea, you know, if you have this $60 machine sitting by this $60 machine, 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 and then, yeah, then you go. And the other thing too, to be thinking about like with repairs, again, this is what I warn people with all those people talking about swapping hard drives is, um, I mean, again, think, think about, think about when your server, think about when your server costs $60, you know, when your server, your free business costs $60. When literally it's like, okay, pull the micro SD card out of this one, shove it in the next one, throw this one in the trash. Oh, are you going to pay Lewis? Are you going to pay Lewis $400 to resolder your $60 server? Probably not. And this is just where we're at now. Again, this thing has a quad core. It's like a 1.2, 1.2 quad core processor. Uh, has a gig ethernet, has 802.11ac wireless, uh, has USB-C. Um, has four gigs of RAM. You can get all the way up to eight gigs of RAM. Hey, our server died. What, what do we do with our old server? Ah, just throw it in the trash. Okay. Man. So those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts on this very fine day. Going into the weekend. Going into the July 4th weekend. Wonder how July 4th will go. Will this be our last July 4th for the United States of America? <clears throat> all the media right now, all the media is in hysterics. Media is in hysterics. So there's going to be so much death. 
so much COVID. So I don't know. I don't know. I'll be curious to see what it's like on Monday. Will everybody have died on Monday? Will I wake up Monday morning? And it'll just be like one of those wasteland movies. Everyone will have died of COVID during the weekend. I don't know. Watching the news. Watching the news is bad for your health. It's just so funny. They're just like, ah. It's weird, though. Have you, have you noticed this with COVID? What they don't really seem to like to talk about a lot is like COVID. The, uh, the uh, actual infection, the infections for COVID are like skyrocketing. But the death rate is still going down. The death rate is still going down. So more and more people are getting infected. And the death rate is continuing to go down. So I wonder what that'll mean at the end of the day. I wonder what that'll mean. I don't know. I'm always stuck at the house. I'm always stuck at the house. My uh, my in-laws are coming. That's the exciting thing that I'm going to... Ooh, yes. Yes. That's what old people do. That's what 40-year-olds do. The in-laws come over to the house. And you make vegan meatloaf. Oh, yeah. That's... that's that's how exciting my, my 4th of July is going to be. I'm going to be having vegan meatloaf. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. I have to say, I have to, beyond beef, beyond beef, vegan meatloaf is actually pretty darn good. We're going to have uh, beyond beef, vegan meatloaf. We're going to have um, biscuits. And we're going to have uh, corn pudding or corn casserole. We're going to be having coleslaw. And then my wife really likes pineapple on upside down cake for some reason. It's really weird when you're married to somebody and there are these weird things like you don't realize they've never had before. I made her I made her a pineapple upside down cake like a month ago. And it was just kind of one of those because we, we, we swap making special dinners. So every every week we make a special dinner on Friday. And so it was my week to make a special dinner. And I didn't really know what the hell to make for, for dessert. So I just kind of went, went with a cheesy. I was like, eh, I'll do pineapple upside down cake. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those weird Midwestern things. Anyways, apparently she had never had it before. My wife, 40 some odd years old, had never had pineapple upside down cake before. And she loves, she loves pineapple upside down cake. No idea why. <laughs> it's like, really? Really? You love it? I mean, like, I made it. It was like, ah, I'll be good enough. But I was like, really? You love it? That's kind of bizarre. So you always learn new things. Been with my wife for 15 years. And last month, last month, I learned she had never had pi uh, pineapple upside down cake before. So, there you go. We're going to have some pineapple upside down cake and some coconut ice cream. Uh, and then listen to everybody in the neighborhood shoot off their, their firecrackers all night. Peanut will be less than amused. P Peanut, little chihuahua. She does not. She does not like fireworks at all. And, uh, yeah, she's not going to be happy. But, oh, well, what do you got to do? So, anywho, anywho, I'm going to go. I'm going to try to clean up that code. I think what I'm going to do for my code, what I'm going to do for my the big thing that I'm going to do for my code is I'm going to turn all of these into more proper variable names. So instead of results, so this will be like dollar sign host name, and this will be dollar sign vendor, this will be dollar sign MAC address. I'm going to do a couple of things like that to like clean up these uh, this, this script. And then I will create a class on it. And then I will put the script up on elithecreatorguy.com for you to copy and paste. Yay! And nobody can watch. It's so sad right now. Now that I'm doing these videos, now that I'm doing technical videos, nobody's watching. Right? When I talk when I talk about I don't know, whatever. When I talk about political stuff, people watch. It's like, ooh. When you talk about parsing XML files, nobody watches. <laughs> It's just the truth. It's just the truth. If you want to be a content creator, let me tell you, if you want to be a content creator, talk about Trump 24-7. If you talk about Trump one way or the other 24-7, you will be successful in the modern world of YouTube. And if you try to explain how to parse an XML file, nobody will care. <laughs> nobody will care. It's just the truth. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So anyways, uh, yeah, EliTheComputerGuy.com. Do remember EliTheComputerGuy.com has new classes coming. This one will probably be up. Um, and uh, if you have comments you want me to respond to, um, if you have uh, tech topics you want me to look into, put them down in the comments to be in the comments. Comments. In the comments. If you put it in the... Put it in the live chat. So when this thing live streams or premieres, whatever it's called, if you put it in the chat from the premiere, I never see that. I only do premieres because I think YouTube wants it. I don't know. Uh, so if you actually want me to like respond to something or do a video about something or whatever else, actually put it into the comments itself. And, uh, and yeah, with that, I'm going to go.
So yay, yay. So if this makes you, I just want you to be clear. If you want to be a tech professional, this is what you're going to be doing. This is going to be your job. If this looks exciting to you, then you'll be a tech professional. If this does not look exciting to you, go be a florist. Run away now. Run away now.